Sometimes in emergency medicine, you just get really excited about something that you really have never even known was a possibility, and that is the stellate ganglion block. Now, the stellate ganglion block is something that there are a lot of applications. I've actually heard about it in the setting of kind of uh, PTSD, chronic anxiety situations. And what it is basically is you're basically inhibiting the sympathetic nerve fibers, and it is kind of a last ditch effort. Now, in emergency medicine, the Probably the most important use is in refractory V-fib or V-tac, ventricular fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia. And this is something that can be very frustrating. You shock a patient, you might get them out of it, and within a minute they get right back in, and it's so frustrating. You might do the dual sequential defibrillation, you might have all the medications in there, you might even start Esmolol as a last ditch effort to treat this ventricular storm situation due to presumably too much sympathetic nervous system firing to the heart. And the, the data is, it's getting there. Now, in emergency medicine, there's a couple of case reports which I'll talk about, but there is a cardiology study that just came out in 2024. It's from Savastano et al. Quite a few authors on here done in Italy. It's called STAR Study Group, Electrical Storm Treatment by Percutaneous Stellate Ganglion Block, the STAR Study. And what they did here is they did the stellate ganglion block in patients that had electrical storm. Now, this is something that is difficult to get good numbers in um, because honestly, it's not that common that we're in a situation where if we just get the patient out of this, they are a higher likelihood of surviving. So this study, multi-centered, 19 centers were enrolled, a total of 131 patients and 180 four stellate ganglion blocks and their primary outcome. Now we're not going to go super in depth here because the whole point of this is to kind of reintroduce you to this because we did talk about this on the podcast quite a few years ago uh, with actually one of the authors of the study I'm going to talk about in a bit, Mike Stone, who uh, frequently was a prior contributor to the Ultrasound podcast. But in these 184 scenarios where they did this, their primary outcome, which was the reduction of treated arrhythmic events by at least 50% comparing the 12 hours before and the 12 hours after this stellate ganglion block, was reached in 92% of patients and the median reduction of arrhythmic episodes was actually 100%. This is really good data, and I will share a link to the PubMed ID for uh, this study. Now, with regards to exactly how they did this, it's not all ultrasound guided, and I'm really only going to comment as far as how to do it on the ultrasound guided aspect of it, um, because that's kind of what I know, what I'm comfortable with. They had an anterior anatomical approach where um, they identified the C6. It has a, a name and it's got an eponym. Um, you can feel it. And they went in between the carotid and the trachea at the level of the cricoid, went straight back um, and injected. And about half, 57.6%, they did it that way. And then the other half, 42%, 0.4%, they went lateral ultrasound guided, which is what we'll talk about. They did the vast majority of them, 98% on the left side, this side, um, which is actually recommended. And what they found is they found good data, good information. I'm going to take a quick pause here to remind you about Sound and Surf 2024. I'm so excited about it. It is an in-person conference Finally, um, here in my home city of San Diego, California, we're going to have some amazing um, world-class instructors, people that I've learned from um, over the past 12 years of doing this. And it's going to be November 6th through 8th. Go to soundandsurf.com for more information. Now, back to the stellate ganglion block. Now, with regards to their complications and side effects, um, they had temporary brachial plexus paralysis, which makes sense because you're very close to it, in 1.6% of patients, hoarseness in 1% of patients, dysphonia, neck pain, vomiting in 0.5, and then they had some other 
kind of complications. Um, their big one, which they had in one patient, was respiratory depression, uh, which is 0.5%, bradycardia in 0.5%, and hypotension in 0.5%, which honestly kind of makes sense with what you're doing. You're getting rid of all the sympathetics. So all the things that sympathetics do and all the things that the brachial plexus, which is in close proximity, does are obviously going to be diminished with it. But on the flip side is potential death, right? This is actually, to me, in the right clinical scenario, acceptable kind of side effects that are temporary, especially if you're using lidocaine, one percent uh, lidocaine, which is what most of the emergency medicine literature uses. Now, this is very exciting, big study. I can't imagine we're going to run into a situation anytime soon where we have emergency medicine also having these kind of numbers in a study. But if one of uh, you listeners happens to know of such a study, let me know. I'm so excited to learn how that goes in our literature, emergency medicine. Now, we do have some case reports, case series on the stellate ganglion block, which I'll talk about next. Now, in the emergency medicine literature, I'm going to talk about three uh, case studies, case reports. The first one is by Calipari et al. It is in the Journal of Emergency Medicine, 2023, May, and it's two cases. And in both cases, they used 10 mLs of 1% lidocaine. They went lateral ultrasound-guided approach, and they were able to clear it, this refractory ventricular storm. There's a study by Nair et al. in 2024, and that is in the American Journal of Emergency Medicine. And there's a case report where they did it to the same patient six months apart and both times terminated it. Um, they used 2% lidocaine in this instance. And then a 2020 study by Margus et al. in the Annals of Emergency Medicine single care support where they were able to clear it, read these studies, and learn more about it. Now, this, again, is something that is quite rare, and I don't think we're ever going to get the amount of numbers that we're able to see in that STAR study, but know that this is something that you could tack on to your tool belt to help our patients that otherwise might not make it if we didn't use an extra very cutting edge thing to help them. Next, let's talk about exactly how to do this block. Now let's get into the nitty gritty about how to perform the stellate ganglion block. Now with regards to the indications, this is going to be intractable ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia. The amount is going to be 10 mLs of 1% lidocaine. You can definitely use other stuff, but this is what most of the emergency medicine literature, which isn't robust, um, describes to do it. Our landmarks are going to be on our left side. That's more commonly uh, where it is the most effective at the level of the cricoid cartilage. And your approach is going to be lateral to medial if you're doing it in plane. So your probe is always going to be here, um, transverse over the neck, but you can either come lateral to medial this way or anterior straight down. Both approaches can work, although the emergency medicine literature does more lateral to medial with regards to their approach. We're going to start off by identifying the right location to start and go laterally. It's going to be the cricoid cartilage, and we're going to go right lateral to that left side, which is around C6. Here is the kind of trachea down here. We have the probe right in the cricothyroid membrane, and we're going to go out lateral here. Now, these muscles here, um, this is probably SEM over here. Um, this is another probably belly of the SEM. And we might have a few other muscles like the sterno or omohyoid. That's probably what these things are down here. But they're just muscles. We know how to identify muscles in the transverse orientation, right? Now, our landmarks here that we're going to focus in on are the carotid artery and the area just deep to or lower than on the ultrasound image, the carotid artery. So it's a little triangular structure kind of down in this area. Now, over here, we have a lateral decompressed IJ. So be careful with this one, but this is going to be our location that we're going to look for. Here's another image. We have the thyroid gland over here, the SEM up here, and we can see a little better right here. This triangular structure is the stellate ganglion. 
Now we have to identify some things that might go through it. We can see this structure right here. This is actually the vertebral artery, which sometimes goes right through that area. See how it's kind of going right through it? But we're going to have our landmarks. We have deep to it. We have the longest coli. And our location is actually going to be this plane just above that longest coli. If we're coming at it laterally, which is the most common ultrasound guided approach, we are going to bring our needle in from lateral to medial, injecting just underneath that stellate ganglion, which we're identifying right here. Now, when you are mapping out your kind of path, make sure that you identify any blood vessels like the vertebral artery, which we might see going right through that stellate ganglion, go below it or above it, um, just so that you don't accidentally puncture the vertebral artery, which is definitely something that you don't want to do. If you're not sure, if there's an artery there, place your pulsed wave Doppler on that circular structure that might be the vertebral artery. And if you see this arterial spike, it's an artery, probably the vertebral artery. Now, I do have an example here on a cadaver of performing the block in plane. We have the trachea here, and we're going to come at it a bit lateral over to the patient's left side um, on this area over here. And we are going to go straight down in plane, which is a less commonly described approach relative to the lateral to medial. This right here is, um, that actually this right here is the transverse process of the cervical vertebral body. Here is a vertebral artery kind of hanging out in that area, just to give you a bit of a landmark. And because this is a cadaver, we have very decompressed blood vessels. So the blood vessel that we want to avoid is this right here, which is the carotid artery. We are going to use our sequential needle tip tracking or our way out of plane approach, uh, which is where we basically have the transducer directly where we want to go and then go straight down. You're not going to get great needle visualization with this, but you go straight down, making sure that you are exactly in the middle of that transducer, you go straight down doing hydrodissection and you look for that hydrodissection, that movement of those fascial planes to make sure that you're in the right place. And right here, we can see that anesthetic spread in the correct anatomical plane, getting underneath this carotid artery next to the stellate ganglion, which is this structure that we're seeing right here. Again, this is a procedure that is a bit on the fringe side. I think more data needs to be done for this. And I'm not necessarily recommending that you do this on your patients. That being said, know that this is something that if you need to perform these heroic measures to try and save a life, that this is something that you can consider, especially if the alternative is someone losing their life. This was a lot, and it's something that really, if you do nerve blocks and do central lines, it's, it's within your wheelhouse, but know that there are things that you have to look out for. It has to be the right clinical setting. You've tried everything, and this is the last thing left because there are structures around there that you have to be careful with. For instance, the vertebral artery, which sometimes goes right through that stellate ganglion, the obviously carotid artery, the trachea is there. So there are a lot of very crucial things that you don't want to damage that are in that area. But when the alternative is a very bad outcome for the patient, such as death, I think that this is a very good thing to kind of tuck in your back pocket. It is a tool in your quiver. It is an arrow in your tool chest. It's something to help you do your best that you can with your patients. Don't forget to check out soundandsurf.com for our in-person conference, Sunny San Diego. It's coming up soon, November 6th through 8th here in San Diego. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be fun. Check it out. I hope to hear from you soon and happy scanning.